Lazarus any more than Jesus did. But Jesus understood that there was something more at stake here. He understood that there was an opportunity here to do something that even to this very day we recall with rejoicing and encouragement because we know that there was a lot more happening in the experience there that also reminds us that the difficulties that we are going through are only temporary because Jesus is going to end it all just the way he did for Lazarus when Jesus returns the second time. You know the experience, I don't need to tell you the rest of the story, but I will remind you that Jesus went to the place where, Je where Lazarus had been laid. He calls for them to open the tomb, and then he speaks the name of Lazarus, and Lazarus comes forth. You can be sure that in the house of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, that day, there was, excuse the expression, because sometimes it sounds a little secular, but there was a party going on. Yes. There was rejoicing. There was a feast going on. There was happiness going on. Now, outside was not so much happiness, because when you read the rest of the story in John 11, there was a plot to kill Lazarus, because they had a problem on their hands. Jesus had raised him from the dead. And as long as Lazarus was alive, he was a testimony to the power of Jesus to raise the dead. So you've got to get rid of the evidence. Are we anything like that at all sometimes in our lives? No, that's another part of the story. Jesus knew what he was about to do and what he could accomplish. So when Jesus says to us, in everything, give thanks... Jesus is reminding us of the power that he has, that even in the difficult times, we need to learn to trust him, because it may be something we need to learn, not just what he can do for others, but also what he's trying to do for us. You see, Jesus sees the bigger picture. He knows that he's coming again soon. But he knows that before he can come back, there is a final conflict to take place in this world. And that conflict is not going to be an easy one. We are told very clearly that most trouble is not nearly as bad as we imagine it to be, except in this case. We can't even imagine what it will be like. So the time to learn to trust Jesus is now. The, learn, the time to engage with Him is now. The time to learn to give thankfulness is now. If you're a melancholy personality like me, I'm preaching to me today. I'm being reminded of the fact that now is the time for me to learn in those small, little, difficult experiences that I have that I need to learn to give thankfulness to Jesus because there's something I can learn. There's a way that I can give honor to Jesus. There's a way that I can rightly represent Him. And this is an opportunity for that to be. Yeah. But I don't like that when I run out of gas or my car breaks down or my tire goes flat or I have to go to the hospital to see somebody who's sick or dying. I may not like it during those times when I'm not feeling well, or my wife is sick, or someone else in my family is in trouble. If you've been studying the Sabbath school lesson this quarter, it just seemed like they fit thankfulness right into the right place. Now, I don't know if they did that on purpose, but I suspect they probably did. And if you study the Sabbath school lesson for this week, there's a part of it that came right along with what we're talking about today. And as you go into next week, it finishes on out. Because the chapter of, uh, uh, the title of the chapter reminds us of worship and what they did in their worship after the experience we were talking about today. But I could not avoid one verse out of our Sabbath school 
lesson for today, so I want to remind you, and that's the second story I want to remind you of in Nehemiah chapter 12. Nehemiah chapter 12. In Nehemiah chapter 12, verse 27, it says, Now at the dedication of the wall of Jerusalem, they sought out the Levites in all their places to bring them to Jerusalem to celebrate the dedication with gladness, both with thanksgivings and singing, with cymbals and strings, instruments, I'm sure there was a trumpet there, Carlo, and harps. And verse 28, and the sons and the singers gathered together from the countryside around Jerusalem from the villages of the Nephtalites and the others. And they gathered. Why? Because here in this verse is an opportunity for them to give thanks. But you have to remember that the book of Nehemiah and the book of Ezra, both of these that we've been studying this quarter, are constantly reminding us of the trouble they went through. The building of the wall, the rebuilding of the temple, all that was happening there brought great joy to their hearts. Not because it was an easy experience, but because it was so very difficult. And they were constantly being persecuted and challenged at every step of the way. But all along the way, they had to turn to God and ask for His help and learn to trust Him. And when they did, they were able to rejoice when it was all over. The experience that they had at that particular time of being able to gather and sing songs and play instruments and to give praise and thankfulness to God was the result of having gone through such a difficult time. I want to turn over to our scripture reading again and put it into the context of what we've just shared. In 1 Peter chapter 4, our scripture reading, Peter, who certainly understood the issues of suffering and difficulty and worked to encourage his fellow believers in the same. Chapter 4, 1 Peter, verses 12 and 13. Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when His glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. I want to go back to the story of Andrew Brunson for a moment. He'd been in prison for two years. He'd gone through already three trials. At each trial, he never knew what to expect. He was hopeful that maybe one of the trials would get him off, or something would happen, whatever. But when you're dealing with politics, you're not dealing with justice. When you're dealing with the kinds of dynamics that the world struggles through today, and Christ is not the its center, you're not dealing with justice. And he was being brought forth again for another trial, his fourth. And as he came together, he says that he actually packed two suitcases. One to take home with him and one to go back into prison. Because he had no idea what was going to happen. As he talked to his attorney, his attorney was trying to give him an idea of what was going on and what to expect. And and the kinds of questions that they might be asking and so on in this supposed trial. But as it turned out, as that trial got going, and it was held in a big, I want to call it a, like a basketball stadium type uh, place, where they brought many people for mass trials and so on, as the trial went on, it was very clear that this was no trial. They had already had the trial behind closed doors. And his hope of being released after two years, it looked like was going to be certainly very quickly shattered. Because it wasn't long before they came out and they simply 
accused him of what they had been accusing him of, of being a terrorist and a number of other things. There were some other things that he was actually facing three what they called aggravated life sentences. He didn't know if he was going to prison for life or something else. Well, it turned out they had thrown out the three aggregated li aggravated life sentences and they were only going to give him a 35-year sentence, which he said was a life sentence. And uh, so they told him that that was the result of the trial, such as it was, and that was what he was told. And at that particular moment, his heart, obviously, and his mind are going through what to experience, how to prepare to go back into prison and to be in that prison again during that time, knowing what he'd already gone through, knowing of his difficulty and his fear of losing his faith and losing his mind. And then in the midst of all this, someone told him, you're free. You're free. And you can only imagine that he was having a hard time comprehending what that was all about. But they had indeed given him his sentence. They had told him what his crime was, what they had accused him of, and what his sentence was. And they would accomplished apparently what purpose they had. And he was set free. And this is what he says about that experience. Came back to the United States a year ago. He's been interviewed by James Dobson, also the interview that I read here from, and I'm reading from that interview from, uh, from Christianity Today in these last few thoughts of his. He says, I had questions about his love. Whose love? The love of Christ. I had questions about his love, loyalty, and faithfulness. But really, he had questions for me. Are you going to be loyal? Are you going to love me? Are you going to remain faithful even if you feel abandoned and disappointed? I was being tested, and it was painful. But when your faithfulness is tested and proven true, there's such a great reward. It brings you to a new level of intimacy with God. What is Peter trying to tell us in the scripture reading? He is reminding us that Jesus is still there. He's still faithful. He's still God. He still cares about us. He wants us to rejoice in Him because He is helping us to prepare, prepare for the next step that He has for us in our personal relationship with Him. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's suffering, that when His glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. So as Paul says, in all things, give thanks. Yes, even thank Him for the hard times. Because that's His way of getting you and me connected with the heart of Jesus Christ. Our closing hymn is hymn number... Thank you. Number 565. For the beauty of much to give thanks.
One last question. How many of you want to ask, Lord, please help me to be thankful even when I don't want to be thankful? Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are truly blessed by what Jesus has done for us. We're gathered here to get together today to worship, to give honor and praise to our Heavenly Father. We want to thank you again for all that you have given us, for family, for friends, for church family, for a place to worship and freedom to do so. And we're praying that as we leave this place, you will accept our gratitude and our praise, and that you will also help us during the times when we don't feel like you to understand the importance of following your instruction and lifting up to you thankful hearts, even in the hard times. In Jesus' name we pray.